In the early 1800s, the majority of Britain's population lived in the countryside. But as people migrated into the larger towns and cities to take up work in industry, urban areas became overcrowded. Trams, costing passengers just a penny a mile, were cheaper, safer and more comfortable than horse buses, enabling the middle classes to move out to the suburbs. London's first tramways began in 1870, and within five years, 55 miles of line had been built for London's 350 horse trams. Suddenly, horse trams were in demand across the country. Cities and towns, large and small, wanted their own tram networks. By 1878, Britain's 300 miles of tramways were carrying 150 million passengers a year, the age of the horse tram had arrived. The horse is terribly expensive. If you run a horse tramway, you have to have a huge stable of horses. If you have a, like 100 trams, you probably have to have 500 horses because the horse will only work for so many hours a day. And so actually horse tramways, the fares on them were for the middle class. The working class couldn't afford to go on a horse tramway really. Tram cars at the time did not look much different to a horse bus with a platform and staircase at both ends. But a horse tram offered a much smoother ride and thanks to the smooth iron rails could also carry twice as many passengers as a horse bus. With holidays by the sea growing popular, seaside tramways developed. One of the earliest, located in Douglas on the Isle of Man, is still in operation and has remained relatively unchanged since it opened in 1876. Thomas Lightfoot, a retired civil engineer, had spotted the potential for public transport along the developing promenade, a single line which was later doubled and extended. Today, the three-foot gauge Douglas horse tram has operated continually, except for a break for the duration of World War II. The high cost of running horse tramways led companies to explore alternative forms of power. Almost three quarters of a century after Richard Trevithick's 1801 steamroad locomotive, self-propelled tramcars were finally being contemplated. To get through to the 1870s before you really start to get mechanical uh, traction in the street it is a long, long time. Civil engineer John Grantham demonstrated an open-top, four-wheel, steam-powered tramcar in March 1873. Able to carry 60 passengers, his tramcar entered service in 1876. The 1874 Howard Medal was awarded posthumously to Grantham for inventing a locomotive to replace horse traction on street trams. The 1870 Tramways Act meant uh, that the local authorities could lay tramways down, they could get a tramway order and then lease them out to the individual operator. But it meant that uh, you could get more stops per mile, you could uh, carry people over a shorter distance than was often the case with the railways. And it meant that uh, people could travel much more cheaply as well. Up till then, uh, if you wanted to build a tramway, if you called it a street railway, you had to get an individual act of parliament to do it, to authorise you to dig up the roads and so on. But it was the 1879 Act for the Use of Mechanical Power on Tramways that enabled the wider use of steam trams and of raising speed limits to a heady 10 miles per hour. But even so, there were still a good many restrictions you couldn't see moving parts and so this gave rise to the traditional square box that, that the steam tram became because a skirt was put over the wheels down to four inches above the, the rail uh, that was taken up so that you couldn't see the firebox coke was used so it emitted no uh, smoke and uh, the steam was condensed in condensers usually on the roof 
and so you, you ended up with this quite square sort of box, uh, box-like engine, and then that was allowed in the street, and so that opened up the, the street for mechanical transport. The first really significant operation was that of Huddersfield in 1885, and that's significant because it was also the first municipality to operate trams in the British Isles. Prior to that date, trams had always been uh, operated under lease by private companies. Huddersfield tried to lease the tramways out, uh, but unfortunately nobody was prepared to take the lease on, and the upshot was that the corporation operated its own tramways. Lightly laid tram tracks, perfectly suited for horse trams, were initially unsuitable for carrying the weight of a heavy-bodied steam tram. But by the 1890s, 500 steam trams were in service on 50 tramways across the country. The remainder stuck with horses. Trials with other forms of traction continued. People tried all sorts of crazy ideas. They had stored steam where they would generate the steam in one place and then put it in, in cylinders within the, the tram in compressed steam form. There were gas trams, there were compressed air trams, uh, a, a clockwork tram, a caustic soda tram where you, you raise the temperature of the water up to nearly boiling point and then dump caustic soda into it. Um, and there are all sorts of ideas that, that never really worked. The ones that did work were cable trams where you obviously had a, a stationary steam engine which pulled a cable round. Cable systems were mostly confined to lines with very steep gradients. There were also a number of unusual cable tramways. The Snaefell Mountain Railway in, on the Isle of Man takes people from uh, the Max Electric station at Laxey up, uh, up Snaefell. So there were a number of tramways that were specifically designed as tourist attractions right from the start. Built in 1895 under tramway regulations, but very much a railway, the three and a half foot gauge electrified Snaefell Mountain Railway is based upon the Swiss Fell Incline system. The Fell system has a, a series of, if you like, cogs underneath the tram which mesh with a, a third rail between the two running lines and that is designed as a safety feature. In other words, the, the cogs engage uh, and it prevents the tram running back except under controlled circumstances. So it's very much designed to facilitate uh, tramways operating over a steeper gradient than would be permissible usually. The last cable tramway to be constructed in the UK, although not a cable tramway in strict technological terms, is the Great Orm Tramway in Llandidno, North Wales. The Great Orm is a, an interesting combination of tramway and funicular. Now, funicular is generally associated with being a cliff railway, i.e. a very, very steep and short ascent and descent. Great Orm is actually technically a funicular because the two cars on each section are permanently fixed to the cable. As one descends, the other rises at exactly the same speed and they have a passing place in the middle where the two pass both on the lower and the upper sections. Constructed in 1902 to take Edwardian ladies and gentlemen to Britain's healthiest spot at the top of the Great Orm, Britain's only double reversible funicular tramway was built in two stages, the upper and lower sections each operating two cable hauled cars. On the lower section it's, it's operated by two cables that uh, are just connected directly to the trams and it's basically just an up and down. The lower section is sort of slightly different because that's on the roadway and everything's underground there. Uh, there are pulleys under the, under the surface, so the, uh, in the, under the concrete. Halfway station is the centre of operations and houses the winding gear or winch drives. A second tramway, built in 1903, 
then carries passengers from halfway station to summit station at the top of the Great Orm. The guys on the front of the trams are the eyes and ears for us, but it's actually the winchmen that are doing the driving. Despite CCTV, the only signals for the winchmen to know when to speed up, slow down, cross points or stop at traffic lights come from the attendants on board the tram cars. The, the tram cars are sort of slowed down and stopped by the winchmen using a series of yellow markers that are actually on the drum and on the rope. Uh, they, they know exactly whereabouts the tram is and how much rope there's left. Each winchman is slightly different. Some will sort of knock it off sooner, some of them will leave it right to the very end, knock the power off and the last little bit will actually glide to a stop. And that's the art of it, being able to sort of do that. <laughs> 